Leads, leads, leads. What is happening? Welcome to Working Hours, a show about a place called Leeds, a time called now, and an activity called work. Working Hours wants to record 1,000 loiners over the course of this, the most important decade in the history of the human species, and ask them about what they do all day and hear how they feel about it. My name is Simon, and this is all my fault. My mission here is to try to map out what my city, Leeds, a city that has declared a climate emergency, did during humanity's biggest emergency. On working hours, we hear how loiners have, are, and will be coping with our multiple and expanding crises during their day-to-day working hours. Can we turn things around? We'll find out. To tell this story, I need loiners, loiners like you, dear listener. I need people in Leeds or people from Leeds to come on this show and just tell me what they do and let me record how this decade affects us. Please do donate any amount you can to the Working Hours Project through PayPal or consider sustaining Working Hours with a regular £1 a month or more subscription on Patreon.com. Addresses for support are in the outro. This is intended as an expansive and expensive long-term project which I want to make available to anyone and I can only do that with your help. So if you can, please help. What did you want to be when you grew up? What did I want to be? Now you've asked me a bit of a tricky question. (laughs) I I think growing up, I think I wanted to always work for myself. I wanted to do something that's going to have an impact on people's lives. And yeah, I think just something, I think for me, it was always looking for, looking for opportunities, shall I say, um, to um, create something that's going to have an impact on whether it's an experience or whether it's just generating someone's life. So I, I wouldn't say there was anything kind of specific, obviously, as I was growing up when I went to uni, when I did my courses, it was it was a very different kind of um, subject that I was studying. So, um, But I think I always knew I always wanted to work for myself and create something myself. You're listening to Series 4, Episode 5, and to my guest, Sam Rain Hussein, is another Zoom interview recorded on the 18th of January 2023. Hello. Sam Rain, or Sam Hussein, is founder and director of TikTok Unlock, an immersive entertainment company that designs, builds, and operates escape game venues. TikTok Unlock was the first escape game in the North, opening in 2014 here in Leeds and quickly growing to sites in Liverpool, Manchester and Glasgow. In April 2017, Sam launched the first ever hyper-reality experience in the UK at the Trinity Centre, Leeds. That same year, Sam also travelled with a group of six other female entrepreneurs to Boston, Massachusetts on an international entrepreneurial mission hosted by Innovate UK Digital Catapult and the British Consulate General Boston. To find out more about TikTok Unlock, go to tiktokunlock.com. This is a second interview for Sam because the quality on our first recording from last year was so bad that there was just no way I would subject you to it. You'll hear beeps in this recording, nothing to add to that. You will, they're in there. It's not all the way through, but they are there. You will notice them and you haven't gone more crazy. Follow, listen, share, guest, donate to podcasts you like. And if you don't like this one, what are you doing here? Turn it off. Loiners, get your arse on this show and then get your friends and neighbours on it too. Join me on Patreon or Ko-fi to provide monthly support or help the show with a donation. Demonstrate your support for this show on social with likes, follows and shares. If you want to keep listening to interviews such as these, then you will need to do something to help facilitate that because I'm all spent up now. I can't make this show popular. I have no marketing budget and clearly no marketing skills alongside no interest in selling myself, so only you can do that for the show. I make it, that's my part of the pact. Share and recommend working hours wherever and whenever you can. Right, let's do this. Episode 85 of Working Hours with Sam Rain Hussein. What is it that you do now then? At the moment, I'm a founder and director of TikTok Unlock. We started off as escape rooms, 
not almost nine years ago and um so obviously we learn we evolved we um with observation customer feedback we've just recently opened um the library of broken books which is um it's not a traditional escape room so we've gone down the route of having more of an open world um where it's a mixture of escape rooms immersive theater and game shows combined together mm. um so rather than being stuck in one room which was a traditional escape room and solving mm. puzzles that's for anyone who doesn't know what an escape room is um so it's a, a where people come together up to six players there's a series of puzzles that you complete to try and get out so for us now we've changed the concept um around a little bit to kind of give people more value for money and also constant engagement mm. um so now for us it's having highly themed rooms going through multiple themed rooms completing puzzles think a little bit crystal maze um escape room puzzles but rather than escape um crystal maze is very one person orientated where this is where you all are involved within the puzzles and it's mm. very heavy storytelling um as well so um yeah which for us obviously as what I do as a business it's creating memories um, and memories last forever so that is Mm. something that um, I love from the day I've done it it's amazing what they take away because we've had different generations of people come and play Mm -hmm. and um, recently we just had a review um, a 17 year old came with a grandparent and they were all able to engage and have fun together and it was Mm. an activity that really brought them together and when I read that review that was like like, yeah, it was music to my ears thinking, Jim, mm. that's exactly what I wanted to achieve. And now they've walked away. They will always remember that moment of being together and doing something mm. fun. Yeah, yeah. I mean, have you had any teething problems with the new the new experience? Did that take quite a bit of perfecting or was it like really well planned and it turned out all right? How did it go? I think it's with any business when you set something up and when it's so new, you will always have teething problems. You will always learn. It's not going to be how you expect it and what it's on paper. Mm. Um, So obviously we were working on this before the pandemic Mm. and then throughout the process, we always knew things are going to change with customer feedback, observation, which we had a clear idea of. And once we were up and running, obviously, I think the biggest challenging um, challenge that we've had is the space itself. Mm. As I think I've never experienced, we've had multiple venues, mul- multiple sites, but because it's a basement mm. and it's an old bank vault, so there's challenges within itself there. Mm. Um, so which obviously ha- like can have an impact on the gameplay on how things are and us with the work so um I've learned a whole new thing about the construction side of things mm. um something which wasn't my forte so I had to dig deep and um just the building regs and mm. as we was building up before we were able to use office rooms and turn them into um escape room we did do construction at other sites but I think being an old bank vault, it's challenging in itself how we play around because we don't want to lose that atmosphere of being a vault either. Yeah. But um, I think there's a lot of just kind of regulations that we have to follow and um, just our build, which took us a lot. There was a lot of setbacks. Um, and again, obviously, we were aiming to be open for a certain time. And when we were open again, there's more setbacks and things. Yeah. Happen. So it's, it's a challenge in itself, but it only makes us stronger and we only learn from it so that's my take from that yeah and you take those risks as well because you know you need to push yourself and kind of try new things and expand I mean so from going from an escape room like that and having that kind of expanse obviously that's like like you say you need much more space for that how does it work cost wise do you have you had to cost it differently because you're kind of paying for more space overall or is it a similar kind of experience and price range um to, to be to be honest, I think we've been quite lucky that um, usually I think combined our venues, which we previously had, it worked at a very similar price due, due to the space. It wasn't being used before. Mm. So it's a new space that the landlord was looking for someone to take on. So we did get it at a, a competitive price. Mm. Um, so and there's been like tiers, etc. So it has worked well on that that end. Uh, but obviously as time goes on that's for us to also ramp our 
bookings um and how how we do things so mm. i think we structured in a way but like i said there's been um a lot of setbacks and when them setbacks happen that you don't plan for mm. um and like uh, just generally just within being an old bank vaults maybe some leakages things like that that you have to kind of resolve as well so mm. um that where things are that you don't expect and you think oh how do I deal with this so it has set us back in the terms of to expand very quickly the plan that we had was to open our rooms and expand expand quickly mm. which has kind of slowed us down due to those reasons so yeah yeah yeah, yeah. let's go a little bit back into the past of the company yeah. what made you decide on escape rooms and how easy was it to set up because I know that you were you were really early on in escape rooms and you were one of the first people in this country as well to kind of get to be doing it so yeah tell us a little bit about that um so I worked in China um so I was working at school um and they had loads of things popping up like this very electronic based things it was like what can we do without tech um, and bear in mind PlayStation children being I've got three nephews who are constantly on their PlayStation mm. and for me it, it was like what can we do where they're actually going so and I love puzzles and mm. um, where they can we can educate but also it's the talk people are talking to each other and solving puzzles mm -hmm. so this so there was enough and especially in Leeds um at the time it was known as a student city and it was mm. more about the bars and um going out drinking so I know in the summer it was dead because all students would go home yeah. and um for me it was like what like what can we do it's an activity and bear in mind no other activity in Leeds and I want you to give it a go so that's where I thought, do you know what? I came back when I came back from China. Um, whilst I was out there, I was exploring for things to do. Like, like I said to you previously, that for me it was always working for myself and creating things. Mm -hmm. And um, and then obviously working at the school, I was like, I want to do something that's going to bring people together. So we 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 thought we'll give it a go. We did it as a pilot, thought let's see how how we get on. We got a, a place in Leeds City Centre, a small office room, mm -hmm. and we didn't do much to it apart from add puzzles within the room, just made it look, it was very officey looking too. So mm -hmm. it's not like we themed it. We just added puzzles. We had two rooms and we connected them together. We had like one room after another where they didn't know there was a second room. So mm -hmm. that was a bit of a wow factor for them. So we added these puzzles, we got people in and within six months we had like, I, I was running it myself, so yeah. it wasn't like I had anyone else. Um, this way I observed, I got customer feedback, I see what worked, what didn't work and don't get me wrong, it wasn't like a finished product that I had implemented mm. it was something that had with observation I had to change I had to tweak to mm. kind of perfect it to gameplay and yeah it's six months like raving reviews people are loving what we were doing we were fully booked we were fully booked without any marketing it was all done through word of mouth yeah. um, because when, when one person came they went and told their friends colleagues and we started to get booked up very quickly and this is then this is where we thought okay maybe we should just to get our brand name out let's go to different cities Mm -hmm. So we um, expand within a year. We opened in Manchester, Liverpool and Glasgow and mm -hmm. we had our second site. We, we moved in Leeds to a bigger place and the reason for the move was they were turning it into um, like a hotel. So mm -hmm. um, we and there was a lot of construction work which had a huge impact on our business. Yeah. So we, we moved then. So everything kind of happened all at once with acquiring all these venues and setting up the escape rooms and um yeah and then we went from there and then obviously then we went on to doing a second room mm -hmm. um and in in leeds we opened our second venue to our second room and then i think within after two years we got the dark arches and mm -hmm. this this is where we learn now people have got the idea of escape rooms and obviously a lot more escape rooms were opening so you mm -hmm. do have that competitive element of how do you differentiate yourselves and um, the next thing was to make it immersive 
um, have rooms that look beautiful and you feel like a hero when you go into the rooms as well mm. as doing the puzzles. Mm. So we went down the theming route um, and our venues, we themed them all up. Our rooms, we themed up um, according to like our branding, which was very steampunk. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, and then before we knew it, everyone seemed to know who we were and wherever I went. And, and it was crazy because like I said, we didn't do any marketing within that year or probably four years because everything because our weekends were always fully booked yeah so we didn't really need to kind of go out there and say we need more bookings or tell people about because it, it becomes <laughs> it for tiktok it become more of a secretive a secretive thing because we were in a building um where obviously we couldn't it was um, a listed building so we couldn't really do much marketing outside mm. so because everyone who came to the building they saw it as an office block. And as mm. soon as they walked in, it was all themed, a very steampunk, and it was a bit of an eye opener. Like they're like, oh, wow, we wasn't expecting this in an office block. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think there was a lot of learning for us uh, in the terms of how do we grow? How do we differentiate ourselves? And um, that's what we did and without without marketing. Um, but obviously now it's a it's a different era where you have to, there's so many compressors and just to get your word out there, you, you have to now. So social media is a huge thing mm. compared to what it was before. It was only Facebook, so got to it. <laughs> <laughs> Were you getting kind of reviews in newspapers or anything? Like how long did it take for them to catch on to it? So the newspaper contacted us um I think they caught on a, f a few months into it. Mm. Um, so we had, it's funny because we had some journalists come and play. Mm. And um, I didn't even know, obviously, they were And then afterwards, they went and wrote an article on us. Mm. And I was like, and then I got contacted by the Yorkshire Evening News saying that they would like to come and speak to me and do. And I was like, oh, okay. So the word kind of organically started to grow that this is what we're doing and we're unique in Leeds. And like I said, I think it was the same time as when the Roxy Bowling opened. So we were the only kind of two things to do in Leeds' mm -hmm. centre. Mm. Um, so, um yeah, and then um, we got a lot of attraction from press and um, not only just within Leeds, within like Time Out London as one of the best escape rooms in the UK. And um, it was, yeah, so it just, the word started spreading. And major and funny enough, majority of our customers weren't the Leeds area best customers. They mm. were from all, they were tourists. So we had yeah. a lot of people come from London. We had a lot of tourists. And at the time, we had the Tour de France. So there was a lot of, obviously, tourists because of that. So that's where just it wasn't just the Leeds area, the Yorkshire area. We mm. had a lot of customers come from far out and the yeah. main started to get around. A lot of Americans, believe it or not, came as well. So, um, it, yeah, it was, um, it, it was a nice mix. And... Um, it was just nice to see how people were finding out about us and clearly Google was doing its thing. <laughs> and it's a really good way, you know, because, I mean, it's there's nothing wrong with being world famous because then at least people in the city know you as well. Yeah. Because a lot of the people will, like you say, they discover it from like things to do in Leeds. And if you're a tourist, you're more likely to look at that. Yeah. And then as that becomes more well known, the locals start to attend as well hopefully. yeah but it's it's crazy because like I even like when you ask people like our first um going back to that stage and it's I always think about the way we started and how it all came about and even like the the first day when we, when we needed testers mm -hmm. so we were like we had our product we had the venue I was like we before we can open we need testers and we literally went out on the streets and we said it, it was like really awkward and we were like look <laughs> it's a new thing that's come to Leeds it's coming to Leeds and we're just looking for testers and um I mean it actually had a really good response because mm. obviously approaching strangers and telling them that you're going to be in a room for 60 yeah. minutes can we um, lock you in a room <laughs> look at it, yeah it, it, it sounds a bit dodgy <laughs> so um um and we did we did we had buskers we had a few other like groups and not only that it wasn't where we were saying come with us now we're going to do yeah, it yeah. we had to give them times to come to us yeah and um so 
that within itself was it, it was a good learning process on how we did that and to get these people come in and it's something that I always say to my own um, staff that sometimes you just need to go out on the streets and approach people because mm. there's a lot of people who won't know and uh, even through our testing period I was like well we went out on the street I had to go and approach people and said look we need and the thing is like and that was such a memorable moment for me because we also got amazing feedback and mm. it was they've never done it before the way they trusted us to come and try it out and mm. not only that they went and told their family and friends and mm. um, we got a lot of people but one one group it was quite funny with them because it was booked for a seven o'clock and um, they came and we had a blackout in the building mm. so they've they've come trusting our word they're coming to do this experience <laughs> for 60 minutes there's no lighting we had to give them torch torches <laughs> <laughs> and they're like what is going on and again it was trying to explain to them look it's safe nothing's going to happen to you we just want you to do the puzzles so they had to work on torches a little bit more challenging for them mm. but again that was a challenge for us as well because then like if we have moments like this how do we work how yeah. do we continue and torches were the way to have a backup and um so I think ev everything we do is always a learning process and um if you don't have them you never learn so mm. yeah mm. yeah and plus you know you've also learned how to handle customers if you know if you wanted to do an experience in the dark say you've yeah. now got some insight on how you would do that yeah yeah like we did our halloween experience in a bank vault yeah um, recently <laughs> and um it was um pitch black and they had torches but we, we have <laughs> we have experience we know what we were doing we have followed the whole health and safety guidelines and mm -hmm. and again the darker it is the spookier it is so yeah. adds to the pleasure for halloween adds yeah. to the experience yeah. yeah. Okay, so I'm going to go into some of the other questions now. Yeah. Uh so we'll start off with uh we'll start off with COVID. So um yeah, so I want to look at basically the experience going into lockdown and then how COVID has changed your work or your working now mm -hmm. if it has at all so yeah so sort of take us through your experience of going into lockdown and how that was for you and then uh yeah if that's changed anything for you um going down into lockdown it was difficult um in the terms of obviously we had to change all our bookings we had to rearrange and that has a huge financial impact as well whereas for us we're not a mean company it's not the fact that you booked with us and we're not going to move your booking or we're not going to do you mean say uh, well I, I think prior to the covid um happening we had before even the lockdown we had a lot of people moving their dates or they couldn't mm. attend um so it was like how do we deal with this and um and for us it was always like okay it's more covering the fees that the expense that we have to pay but we will move it because I know some companies where they don't do a refund at all mm. um, for, for customers. So for us, it's like if they've not had an experience, that is not fair to be mm. charging them. Mm. And that's always been my thought on like just generally pricing and how we do things that a customer it's unfair to take customers money if they've not had anything. Mm. So now come up to COVID it was we had to move people so what we did say to them that we will move your booking and obviously we don't know how long this at the time we didn't know what was happening how long it's going to go on so we just moved everyone across to when we will be back open because obviously we had there was a moment of time where we had to close everything and then we also offered um gift vouchers um because giving everyone a refund obviously that would have had a huge impact and then we um gave everyone gift vouchers there was no deadline on the actual gift vouchers it was like when we're back up and running you can use these gift vouchers there's no 18 months on it mm. um and then to be honest Simon we were quite lucky uh in the terms of when COVID hit um as you know we were talking about this new venue we were looking for a new venue to do this um new experience and then as soon as we hit March, we had, um, co when the COVID hit, our lease was expiring for our, some of our venues. 
Mm-hmm. The Leeds one, especially at the time we were supposed to be signing in March, we got hit with COVID ourselves. So mm-hmm. we couldn't really do anything about it. And then when time came, we had the, obviously the, the Leeds girl paperwork, everything done. And then we didn't really know where we were standing because they didn't make it very clear that the landlords exactly where we stand. Mm-hmm. And if we did sign and say, with COVID, we don't know how long it's going to go on for. Yeah. But we took our gut instinct at the time and we said we're not going to review, like, renew the venue. Yeah. And um, for us, it was like, we don't know how long it's going to go. And then we're going to be paying for something, yeah. which is going to have a huge impact on us as a business. So strategically, we made that decision of saying, okay, we will let go of the venue and mm. we will start looking at another one. So we let go our leads, Liverpool, Manchester, Glasgow, all of them. I went during the pandemic with the vision of opening this new so it's like okay we need to new work on this new format mm. it was difficult in terms of our staff we had to let go a lot of our staff mm. um and again for where we had we had a handful still on furlough um and throughout the process it wasn't just you're on furlough you're this we always communicated with each other about this new venue in the terms of where we're going to go with it so we kept them engaged for us the worry also was just their mental health mm. on um how they're coping and especially like um our ops manager i um, just making sure that touching base seeing that they're okay because i know some of them are living on their own or their students mm. so it was just keeping the team together and having that muscle it it was more or more of let's have a chat and let's see where we can go with this so we wanted this new venue that we were creating we did want that input and we did want them to be involved and feel part of something during that time yeah. um so like I said, a bit for, like we were fortunate in the terms of our leases at end and we didn't have that burden financially of yeah. we have to still pay the rents yeah um but then it was hard it was hard because of the team and some of the people that we did have to uh, let go earlier on prior to obviously the pandemic and then we did have the people who were on furlough but it did have a huge impact on them and even Mm -hmm. I think after when we started back up so bear in mind I think started opening back up um I think it was a December we opened back up with our railway arch where we were at Mm -hmm. and you did you could see that even the staff were a bit anxious and getting back into things because they were so closed off from things um and they they said it themselves they said that they just it just felt a bit and being and they were eager to get out there but it just felt because it was a completely new world yeah and being Um, back in a space with people that yeah and strangers and being in a confined space and and bear in mind Sam, this is this for them like work and when you have a work family and then you're constantly meeting people mm. it's a uh, the people 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 do you mm. mean so for them then to kind of just go away and not be with anyone but then having to come back and do their role and be in front and obviously everyone had their own kind of ways of dealing with things so mm. and and I, and I saw it I saw it within the staff like how anxious they felt and felt a little bit like panic panicked and stuff I had a few members of staff who also had panic attacks Mm. um but that was for me to always check on them and to see if they were okay um Mm. but we pulled through and obviously we didn't open straight away um after everything had opened um with due to our venues closing down so the railway arch that was open until the December but um, Railway Network, they're doing stuff in Leeds, so we had to let go of it. That was mm. them who kind of pulled the trigger on that side. Um, so, yeah, so I think the library of broken book for everyone on the team, it was like a hope of we're going to do something amazing. We can't wait for this to be open mm. and work on it. And they did, and everyone pitched in. Everyone had a say. We, we all worked as a team, and it was like my vision – to come to life but with some amazing people around me who have been in this field and who have executed on the games and stuff and Mm. um yeah so um and yeah so this year last year our dream happened and it opened and we are where we are today Mm. I mean was that I mean was it a scary time for you because obviously you know you you're very much an experienced in-person business and then you closed and then we're closed for such a long time um obviously you had some 
you know things things worked a little bit in your favor in some instances obviously lots of things working against you but um I mean were you able to provide anything as like online experience it would like what did you do that's, while you were yeah, so that that's something that we didn't do and um for us I think well it the key was to work on this um, experience but not only that I think the pandemic in a way it gave me the opportunity to spend time with my family mm. I have two very young children and I, at that time um some of my my children um like my daughter's six and my son's four now so at that time Jim, they were at nursery and they were very young so it did give me that which before um prior to that I'd always been working it was me constantly on the road mm. and to the different venues with my child so I think it gave me that time to wind down a little bit and think about where we are what we've done um, as a company um, so we also did the hyper reality experience I don't know if you're aware of that it was a VR experience in 2017 so I think it went from opening escape rooms opening the first one rolling out to multiple cities then we um, themed our we got the dark themed our rooms then we did the UK's first virtual reality so there was like in the UK, there wasn't anything like this. Um, there was a company in the US who was on a concept stage and they had raised about 10 million or some, something along um, that line. Um, whereas um, we had, it was a multiplayer VR, VR experience with immersive theater. So what you saw in the set and when you put your headset on, it was exactly the same. And there was a game, there was like a puzzle based game and then game within that. And again, it was for multiple players to play and different generations. And with VR, we found that it wasn't for um, like a lot of people saw it as a gamer game. And in the UK, there wasn't any funding at the mm. time. Um, so I got selected part of Innovate UK to go to Boston as um, there was um, seven of us who got selected to go and experience how their funding and how everything works out there, looking at the tech side. Yeah. And what I found there um, was obviously what we've done in the UK is two years too early and there's no funding for anything like that so I think a lot had gone on prior to the pandemic and we had worked on so much where it was constant constant trying to differentiate ourselves and as an individual I never spoke about me or this is what I'm doing or this is for me my vision was always about creating these experiences for our customers that are going to be memorable and um, I think when pandemic came, it kind of gave me that time to slow down because I also had two very young children during yeah. that time. Um, so it gave me that family time to think about where I want to take TikTok and what the vision forward is. Yeah. Um, and I think that's where I, I took a step back and just see my children grow up, which gave me the, the two years to kind of really spend time with them and even mm. my husband just to kind of have that family time which we very rarely had due mm. to travel and work so mm. um and I think if we hadn't pulled the trigger of the leases that would have been a burden and I think mental mental health of mine would have been a lot more where I would have constantly been worrying and yeah. thinking, where do I go with this um, yeah. it's a huge financial risk that you take and yeah. um, I think we were extremely fortunate to pull the trigger when we did and yeah. not to have that during that time yeah, yeah okay so the obvious question that I want to ask are you back up to speed now and are you back up to sort of pre-pandemic levels or are you busier or like what's um, what's the comparison to like yeah how does it feel now we we are we are busy and we're getting busy um I think what what we were before the pandemic um a lot of people don't know that we are um up and running Mm. And a lot of people don't know that we've um, come up with a new experience. Mm -hmm. So I think it's um, still, it's slowly getting out there and feeding out to people what we are doing. Mm. But I think we are still at that stage of it's just gradually building up. Um, 
and I think that's through our social network and um, just our marketing and how how we're doing things and stuff. So mm. we're we're not quite there where we would like to be, mm. but we we are we are getting there slowly. I think the word slowly getting out and getting the corporate bookings and people talking about us. But I think there could be a little bit more of a push to kind of get to. Um, and I think recently, like like I said to you, I've always been the type of person I've been a little bit more of a close person. Um, and it's always been about the business. And I've not really liked to kind of shout about this is who I am or this is what we're doing. Mm. And I think after one thing that I have learned um, after the pandemic that um, now to get out there, it's something you have to do. And recently mm. I've just um, I'm started using LinkedIn quite a lot. And just to build my own connections and learn from the community that's around me. As as you know, the immersive industry is huge at the moment within mm. the UK, actually worldwide. And whether it's through retail, whether it's through experiences, hospitality, the whole immersive side is, is a big thing. And I think within the last few years, it's been about my children, being about work, getting where I want to. But I think now for me, the key thing is to kind of get myself out there and said this is what I have done and this is what we are doing and I've recently done that in LinkedIn and I can't believe like how many different people I've connected with who are in similar fields and Mm. who I can learn from and I think before it was a very straight thing this is what I'm doing but now just connecting with people from all over the world and Mm. things even like on TikTok things that you learn or you see and so um, I think I'm ready to tackle the world now and to kind of like say, do you know what, I want to share my experiences. I want to share what we're doing and where we're going about because we've had recently people reach out from like even Saudi to different about the concept, which is quite, quite nice. So um, I don't know where it's going to take us, but it's just good to have them conversations and tell people what the vision is. And um, I think for... Um, going on, uh, going back to the Library of Broken Books, it's such a unique experience. And I think the way the way my vision was and the way I've designed it, you have experiences. And I think with the traditional escape rooms, you can create multiple rooms, mm. but you have one story. And within the story, like you have, where do you go with it? You have this room, how long is it, is it going to last? It's very linear. It's very mm. linear on the way things are done. So whereas the Library of Broken Books, the direction that we can take with it is endless because it's about stories and you are doing puzzles through stories. You can create different stories. So currently we have like a spaceship themed room. We have a bazaar. They're very contrasting rooms. Yeah, yeah. So now with that, and obviously we have librarians who are hosts and the stories around the librarians. But not only that, if... I want you to now with the Library of Broken Books go down the education route with it and say, for example, I want to introduce introduce phonics and do something for preschool children within the Library of Broken Books. It's something I can do because our stories are endless. Um, If I wanted to go down the corporate training and say, okay, how can we add a story around training these people? we can do that it's very Mm. adaptable in the terms of we can shorten the experience we can Mm. extend the experience and not only that if we can if we were to set up somewhere we could play with the space so Mm. where the way we've created it now it is an endless direction whether someone wanted to do a film on it someone it's a kind of open-ended open-ended library with lots Mm. of stories so Mm. I think that that was the vision to kind of with the library of broken books to have um it going not being linear and a lot of businesses i learned from it a lot of businesses go down the linear route like you do have crystal maze crystal maze you do it once are Mm. you going to go back Mm. um yes maybe with another team or another friend but once you've done it you've done it nothing changes whereas within the library things will evolve, things will change all the time. So it's like an open world of puzzles Mm. and you can adapt it to different different groups and different um, um, expertise where people want it. So I think that was the vision forward. Don't have it closed, just open it up to everyone. Mm. So it's it's like the nice, perfect framing device being your container for everything, for all your content. (laughs) Think of it as an adventure that never ends. 
Yeah. Okay, it's an adventure. It's not just a game or uh, some, like like an escape room that you go. It's an adventure that's never going to end. And again, with our rooms and um, the vision, which we are still working on, is the rooms should have so many puzzles, whereas we're not escaping in the library of broken books, we're collecting keys and mm. it depends on the difficulty. So we can have as many puzzles as we want in that in that mm. one room and make it replayable by saying, well, if you've not completed it, why don't you go and try and comp come back and compete and see how many keys you get the next time? Mm. So you're creating something, again, the re replayable aspect to it, but, also giving that people that satisfaction if they don't complete. So it's like a game, video yeah. game, right? Yeah. It's when you play, why do you play? You want to beat your score. So mm. we've added that to the library to beat your score and mm. give that give that gamer that satisfaction of, do you know what, I've got this score, I'm going to go higher. Like with our VR, we did learn that um, when we it was based on a point system and we had certain groups who came and said, if someone beats our score, this is our number, give us a call and we'll come back. So <laughs> you do have elements like that. But then on the other hand, you hate you have people hate scores and don't want to compete yeah. because they feel under So it's us again when you said, Do you feel you have you, you're complete with what you've done? No, I don't think it ever is because it's mm. always going to evolve around our customers' needs. Mm. And so you can have you done anything bespoke for anyone yet then have you like because you obviously have that capacity there now yeah we've done it we've done it for corporate so yeah. um like for example like our, our game rooms at the moment um we can hold up to 28 people mm -hmm. so but we've had corporate groups who are saying that we've got about 50 people we've got 60 people we can accommodate that because we use our gaming elements and our open world and our tabletop games. Mm. And because it's all very um, immersive theater storytelling, we mm. add other elements to connect these. So like say half will do the rooms, half will do our tabletop immersive storytelling, and then they will swap over and which works a treat for our customers. And everyone so far has really enjoyed it, um, mm. especially the corporate. I, I mean, I, I I assume now before we move on to social media, I assume mm -hmm. that you're sort of have you got your work life balance kind of where you want it to be now? Like, are you, are you working in kind of a hybrid mix or are you just like going to the office as much as possible because it's good to have the office? I mean, are you do you have an office space yeah. and then you have the the rooms or is it you working from home and the rooms are your I'm house? I'm currently working from home due to I have obviously a lot of things on the radar as yeah. well as the library of broken books but I have an ops manager who we are mm. constant and um, every day we have see where we are what we're doing and where we need to go the direction we take mm. and again we have a fantastic team who are always on hand regarding the games of booking, wanting to um, help kind of make the experience better, help with the changes. And it's not just me or the ops manager who are constantly observing. It's mm. the team. The whole team are constantly giving feedback on this works. Maybe we should change this. And I think the best thing about the team that we have, and I think it's any time when we've hired individuals it's about like the different fields everyone's from so you have maybe someone who is in the immersive theater you have someone who's very creative with the art so we have a mixture um of people in the team so that way having everyone's feedback really helps to kind of make the experience better mm. so i'm going to ask about social media next mm -hmm. um so the question is how much time do you have to put into it? Obviously, you've said you you're kind of focusing a bit more on it now. Yeah. Um, and you, you've already suggested that 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 time that you're spending is kind of returning that investment. So, do you, are you finding social media useful? Are you finding it quite easy to get along with? Like, have you got a whole strategy, or are you just kind of feeling your way? Or what what's your approach? It definitely works. Um, but it's trying to find out where your target market is. Um, 
I feel old on social media <laughs> in the terms of obviously now there's TikTok and there's obviously Instagram. I was always a Facebooker. So everything for me, it's like Facebook, Facebook. And to be honest, majority of my age range is still like Facebook. Um, if you tell them about the amount of times I've said to friends, are you on TikTok? And they're like, what's that? <laughs> or like no why would I be on TikTok so um and then we have a different reaction from the team on uh, on site because they are all very much uni students mm. so TikTok is their era so they're like what and they they don't even get why we do anything on Facebook mm. um and um, so I have to kind of like also explain to them that even though I know I get it that times have moved on and there's new social platforms but TikTok is where you do have your like around about your mid 30 people or going on 40 who still use Facebook and it's where they they're not on TikTok or anything so I think it's trying to um, and obviously with Facebook we know that with with all their changes they made and stuff with the data uh, like privacy and that so that kind of doesn't help because you don't know who you're targeting or where you're targeting or ah, mm. is it reaching the right people um but Facebook does seem to work for us. We do get a lot of bookings, so we do track it uh, in terms of where our bookings are coming from. And again, you have Google. It's about updating things on Google, and um, now they have a completely different platform. So it's learning all that. And mm. um, I'm not going to lie, it can be a bit tedious. Mm. <laughs> it can. And I think it's just analysing. And um, for me, yeah, ideally, I would like to eventually outsource it. Um, but then... I also like to know how things are done and what is used myself and I do like to learn so I'm not it's not where I think throughout the business I've always done like worked on the game design I've always seen things yes we did hire people then to work with us on the game but for me it's always overseeing things to make sure it's with our vision again mm -hmm. like now I want to understand how social media works and I know like TikTok is like huge and especially for the younger generation and mm. just the content that you have to have and it's not about selling yourself it's mm. about having memes or videos that's going to attract people mm. so if you are in an escape room what can you do to attract and um it's not constantly shouting me 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 i'm here or we're doing this it's mm. more about things that go viral things that you said videos you, videos you do so it's always thinking thinking of that perspective and if I was a young person or how would what would make me really watch the content so I think mm. it's a deeper understanding it's a, just a psychological side of things as well of what people's thought process is and um, why they click on things and looking at the analytics to see what is it women is it men what type of again it's, it's something little but even like the type of pictures you put up is it yeah. more towards like for example we have our spaceship and we have our bazaar or the witches and um, post office so i know straight away the target market for the spaceship you will see more men go mm. for it and click on it for if you had something like the witches post office you are going to have the younger market be intrigued by it if you have like the bazaar it's going to be the women or generally the library of broken books it's the women who do tend to click so it is something that we are spending money on and I'm, I'm also trying to understand like I said yes eventually I would like to outsource but I do want to have that understanding behind how social media works and where is the best way to spend the money and then this way, when you do go out to professional, at least you know what you're talking about or where the money's spent and have that understanding. Mm. Have you got a person employed in it or are you doing everything yourself at the moment? Um, at the moment, we we did, before pre-pandemic, pre we did. We mm. did have someone who were doing our social media. Um, but at the moment, it's just myself or my ops manager who is amazing. So... <laughs> she's she's very on the ball she I think myself and her we've there's a lot of things we've learned about social media together and mm. um just how it works and where we need to spend the the money and where we get the returns etc you kind of have to be everywhere don't you but as well I think as a business sort of going in you know like quite often they'll say get really good on one platform you know get to use that get to know it do you know what I mean of like yeah. concentrate in particular areas and I think it very much is 
like you do need a different approach on each platform to a degree yeah, don't you absolutely and I think looking back at obviously before we had multiple sites we had multiple games mm. and it did obviously make sense to have someone there who were continuously um sending out things but it's also making sure that you don't bore people with the content as well mm. um, and it's not the same type of content where it's not interesting and um, looking at the type of imagery you've got to mm. what you're saying or what is something new about you how do you differentiate yourself than any other escape room right mm. it's like when everyone does the same it becomes boring and mm. I know for myself when I see like certain content but I'm like oh it's the same old same old and mm. um where then then there's no difference between you you and them so I think for me as at the moment we haven't um to try, I, I haven't as of yet rolled out to the different cities but for me we are still a small business so I have that up and I feel lucky enough and I have the opportunity to learn to learn what is happening where things and o overseeing things and um and then as we expand then I know the right direction to take I I'll know the right people that I want to hire and what they focus on because yeah. like for, for example TikTok has their own specialties of bloggers and who go around and do that who I have been speaking to mm. um and where they charge a fee and then they do like these different posts and that and talk about yeah. you and again their target market are the leads area or they are the followers of Yorkshire yeah. so it's me having that understanding rather than me saying to someone okay you're a marketing you do marketing great I want you to do take over my social media and bring in I, I, I need to see the results yeah but surely they can't like like sir it's like like they obviously this one specific blogger he said to me their focus is purely tiktok that's what they focus on mm -hmm. so for tiktok if i know actually i want to for this age group this is the type of content i could work with them and say okay this is a budget going there facebook mm -hmm. okay who do i need for facebook what would make it who is the best person or the best who work on facebook so it's trying to figure out the right people as well that you that you bring on the team mm. or what what they're used for so it's it's not just about hiring someone bringing someone on board and telling them to do marketing it's not and mm. for me that's where I need to have that understanding of as a business where I at where I'm at and the business is at and how I need to direct it the right way mm. Mm. And I think that's a really good approach as well. You know, it's that whole thing of sort of, I mean, you know, as a business owner, you don't have to understand everything, but I think it's beneficial yeah. if you can have, you know, you've got some experiential knowledge from, from doing it and from having your own ideas about how you want it done and, you know, and your own knowledge about what works for yourself and for the company. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And another thing, Simon, I think with escape rooms, it was I'll, I'll give you a prime example of um even like when we did expand we had multiple sites bringing on a manager just to oversee obviously um, just a manager in place mm. we we did try it it was tested it didn't work when you bring someone in and when it's obviously escape rooms were so new it wasn't a business where do you mean it's been going on for years and they yeah. haven't said about it and it's for a manager for me they need to know things from bottom up right yeah. so it's like we did bring on a manager who were absolutely fantastic at what they did but unfortunately like you need to know the roots of things and it it, it, it didn't work because it was just that understand they didn't have that understanding and they had to dig deep into the understanding of the game and the gameplay because if you don't have knowledge about it you can't help your team and you can't help your team grow and tell them what they should be doing so at a moment says something goes wrong in the room and or something goes wrong with the puzzle it's for me, it was always like, okay, take this direction, do this, now do this, don't go in and ruin the experience, just direct them towards this. That's the understanding and knowledge you have. And that's something that we learned very quickly that you have to build your team from bottom up. Yeah. They need to know, they need to know how all the games work. They need to have the approach of how to solve the problem. And mm -hmm. um, they need to be a doer because if something goes wrong, they need to stretch straight in. 
Mm. And even our, like, for example, our ops manager, she started off as a game master. Mm. She and she had the passion from day one when she started. She did have like managerial skills when she came in. And one thing she said, she made herself known and she said that she would like to work her way up. And for me, it was like, if you want to work your way, you have to prove it to me. You need to know all the games. You need to be the problem solver. Mm. And that's exactly what she did because she observed, she watched, she watched how things can go wrong. And now she knows the ins and outs of mm. everything. If something goes wrong, she's there. She knows who's to, who to call. She. So I think it's also crucial, like the people that you bring into a team mm -hmm. is you can't just bring anyone and say, this is your title and this is what you need to do. Mm. And for me, I'm a big believer now that anyone who I bring on, I want them to grow and I want them to grow within the company mm -hmm. um, because opportunities are there. Mm. And you can only do that by learning. And the majority of our game um, masters, I've always given them the opportunity, whether it's a creative lead or whether it's a, the opportunity, you can work your way, but you have to know the ins and outs of the gameplay before you can get to that stage to tell someone else what to do. Mm. Mm. Yeah. No. Again, I think that's a good approach. Uh, I'm going to move on to another question. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm going to ask about, I'm going to do Brexit basically. So yeah, since we have Brexited, has that changed your work at all? How has that affected things for you? Can you even notice mm -hmm. that it's... <laughs> yes, no, yes, I can. Right. Um, I'm, I'm just trying to think of Brexit when that went in place to the pandemic. It was all mixed and matched. It was 2021, it? beginning of 2021. Yeah, so it's all two, been such Two a years ago now. Yeah, yeah so it's, it's, it's been such a combination <laughs> of everything. Yes, absolutely. And more so now where people are spending less I'm um, on going out, um, especially entertainment. And I think food would be a priority to majority of people mm. um, rather than spending on the entertainment. So we are seeing, I think, just the general public doing activities. Mm. You are seeing um, lower bookings for that. But corporate, again, after the pandemic, they've come out a little bit stronger wanting to do things. Mm. So we balanced it out with our corporate clients. But yeah, you you are seeing people are doing a lot less activities. Mm. But um, but then I don't know, like as we go into obviously we have Brexit, but then we are we are we are this so we are in a recession. Mm. So how's it gonna be? How's it gonna be within the next couple of years with the recession? Are people so I think it's a bit of an a limbo because you're like, are people gonna not go on holiday as much mm. and have staycations and mm. spend more money here? Mm. I do know I did go to a conference, an uh, entertainment conference, leisure and entertainment conference last week. And the talk there was that people are probably planning to do more staycations and where the entertainment industry, more and more people are wanting to do stuff. So that's why, because um, especially in London, actually not even London, Leeds, Leeds, so many things have opened, like you've got the electric shuffleboard, you've got the electric darts, you've got, but they do have that vision of people are going to be staying it's going to be a staycation then they will be spending because they will need to get out and do things just to mm. kind of have that relief and the mm. entertainment centers are good for that so mm. i can't like yes i have seen a decrease mm. but i don't know how the next I, I don't think anyone knows how the next two years or how things are going to go and how they're going to pan out I don't I don't think anyone knows how the next yeah. two days are gonna go. Yeah, I think it's just <laughs> everything is just in a bit of a limbo and mm. I think it's just the fun, the jobs, the pay, the uh, yeah, you just don't know. Obviously we know mm. that there's gonna be a decrease in a lot of things, which is already showing. But um regarding the entertainment industry and where we're at, I I, I don't know. Mm. Um so I've uh, had someone else on and they were saying, so I just want to see if this this rings true for you, um, that when we get the stories about cost of living, the spend drops for them because they, they were in a bar and it's like every time the headlines come out of like cost of living, people won't come out. And then, you know, and then it'll be a while and then they'll start coming out again. Have you seen that at all? 
Or do you think it's a general overall, like... I think it's a general... It depends on how fixated you are on the news and how much... Because we, we do know that media twist a lot of things as well. Mm. Um, but it's um, but then I know there's a lot of people who are bought into the media and start panic buying or panic over things as mm. well. So it's... Um, yeah, you can say maybe we have had lower days of bookings but like sir for us we're so new into what we're doing and how we've opened there's still people finding out about us. so it's a mm. bit of a i don't i don't know whether it's to do with the spence or people not knowing about us if, if mm. you know what i mean yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. so i think we're, we're still at that early stage of people know about tiktok but do they know that we've got a new format and we've done mm. something new that that's the key question or is it people are genuinely worried and I think with the with the bills of Jim and the gas and electric and mm. I think that is it's it's crazy and obviously we've had we've had a, we've had a cold winter this year as well so mm. it's not like previous years where you think oh okay it's where the snow I know in London we had snow and yeah it was here for days and We've never seen snow like this in London before, which was crazy. <laughs> we were like, and as we were driving back from the other side of London, it was just snowing to a point where we were driving at like 10 miles per, per hour. Mm. And even to get the car into the driveway, <laughs> we were a bit like, well, we've never seen snow. What do you do? What do you do? <laughs> especially for Londoners, there's no gritters on the road. And it was a bit of a oh our school's gonna be open because never experienced it before so <laughs> I think it's it, it's one of those things isn't it it's like um yeah obviously October was the first time with the bills hiking up and mm. now people are going to start getting their bills and there's yeah. going to be I think it's gonna it's gonna feel real it's I think that that's the key thing it's gonna feel real once they have these bills to pay and I think when mm. the government announced stuff and obviously with the bills going higher it's it's something it was on everyone's radar and okay it's interesting how mm. much is it going to go up but I think when you have the bill to pay that's a different the different situation yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, absolutely I the other thing that I was going to ask was um student wise like student numbers have you seen like have they come back have they are they returning because you said you, you're not, kind of picking up corporate clients so I'm just wondering if that our, our students really, kind of coming back not really we've not mm. had that many students I'm just trying to think even especially for like September um because I would imagine quite a few of your clients would have been students you know of, of course and obviously yeah. students are huge in Leeds um we probably do you know we probably have had students but not to a point where I picked it up because every time a booking's made they would say what yeah, they've yeah. heard of us um and recently I think we've offered the student discount but it's not been on my radar to say oh we get mm. a lot of students mm. no I wouldn't I think majority is families we're getting a lot of um I don't know whether it's a miracle of TikTok. <laughs> We're getting a lot of um, children's birthday parties, which works mm. amazingly because we have it's um, live actors. And what we found that children love engaging with actors mm. and it becomes, they feel like the hero of the story and that communication um, so we're getting a lot of like 10 to 14 year old parties and parents calling mm. saying my child has requested to have this party and mm. it's um, so the only thing that I can really think of is is it that TikTok where it's hitting the younger age yeah. group of yeah. our content so because otherwise I'm just thinking where else can a 10 or a 14 year old hear about us um, mm. so yeah so yeah well but that's it once you're into that that circle you know like the the playground grapevine you, you're in there then aren't yeah you? <laughs> yeah and like it is it's crazy because like again it's the child then telling the parent and yep. the parent like oh we're so excited they're so excited about it and they've been telling us all about it and I'm like oh wow okay so um and they go <laughs> and tell their parents to book them in for a birthday party which is yep. great <laughs> yeah which is pretty much a guaranteed sale because you know the parents are eventually going to have to relent <laughs> exactly and not not only that I think obviously we have the birthday parties which is fantastic but we are having a lot of um 
family days out so um children like where families can bring their children with them and mm. um explore and have fun and I think me being a parent and um, when I do activities for me it's not about me or mm. I want to do this it's more about I want my children having a good time so when they have a good time I automatically have a good time because I know do you know what mission accomplished they they really had a good time and I enjoy and I don't even think twice about oh they didn't have this or this wasn't right or this to me it's like okay they were happy they were laughing we were mm. there for so many hours it was great so yeah. to me anything else doesn't really count it is more what makes sense. and I think that goes with every parent and something we've observed also in the games is when the children are doing something and the parents are then when something happens that wow mm. moment the parent gets so excited because the child's excited mm. um and I think that's what we've always tried to see our games as that try to cater it for from different angles and I've also said always said to my team that when children and parents come always make it about the children Mm. because it doesn't the parents don't really matter at that moment of time because they're just thinking about the children so mm. yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah which is um, great because loving love seeing families and having an activity that caters for that family because there yeah. isn't many things out there and when you're doing something that's like you know to a degree performance yeah. You know, kids are always better to perform to because they're more engaged most of the time. Like they'll react and they get excited. And, you know, the, whereas a parent, you know, if you're performing for an adult, you have to really kind of work a bit more to get yeah. them involved. Funny you mentioned that because we've always had families come to TikTok and we've always had, um, and it's oh, it's been a great observation because you have children see things for what they are. They don't overanalyze. Mm. And you've had groups where the parents overanalyze and go, it's this, this, this. And a child is saying to them, no, mom, it's this. Or dad, it's this. And they've gone, <laughs> no, no, no. And we're like, and we're like, no. We're like, listen. And so we've had to like send a hint, say, maybe listening to the child. You know? <laughs> maybe they're on the right track or something. So it's, it's funny because obviously the parent has it in their head that they're always right. Yeah. And then they're like, and then when they find out the child and the child or the child just goes and does it and they know exactly what you're doing and you're like, yes. <laughs> to be fair, escape rooms, it's all about, it's things that are obvious and it's about mm. putting together. There's nothing complicated about it. Mm. And there's nothing that, do you mean, it's not done in a way where, obviously you might have some red herrings and stuff, but it is literally in front of you and it is yeah. in black and white, but it's about how you piece it together. And as adults, we overanalyze everything yeah. and we'll start thinking something of something and it just goes off on a tangent. Whereas um, with a young child, they don't. They just like, oh, this is it. And the amount of times we've seen games and we've like, it's just been led by a child. Mm. You just think, amazing. Um, <laughs> children, children are definitely winners in escape rooms. I have to say. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. I remember with um, you know, you mentioned Crystal Maze earlier, and yeah. they. You know, when they did the kids one of Crystal Maze, do you remember that? Because all the kids had written in and were like, all oh, these adults are rubbish. We could do much better. And they brought a whole bunch of kids. No, in. I didn't. I didn't see that one. No. Yeah. So they, they well, they, I think they did a few of them after that. But like, yeah, that initial one. And so all they, they brought all these kids in and the kids were better. Yeah. <laughs> they, they, they're just more. They just see how it is, don't they? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, don't we've, we've, had, we've, had, don't panic. <laughs> we've had actually like families who are arguing because they're saying no, or the child is saying, this is it, this is it. And then the parents go, no, no, wait, I think it's this. And you're just like, they're going, please just listen to the child. <laughs> <laughs> you need a sign in the room or something. The kid's right. <laughs> yeah. So I think I've learned from that. So whatever my my children usually say, or that I'm like, Okay, I'll go with what they're saying. It, it might be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that question originally started on Brexit. I'm gonna I'm gonna bring <laughs> yeah, sorry, I went off on a tangent there. No, no, that was me as well. I, um yeah. uh so just on the on the Brexit front, on the kind of recruitment front and stuff, how's recruitment for you and retention and like staffing okay? Amazing. Yeah, amazing. It's have um... you kind of kept a core group and the yeah we've our um so recruitment i always i always do the recruitment so whether it's with other colleagues or even like my partner i have a specific kind of way and vision of how 
the team members and I have a really good eye for certain individuals and putting them in a certain seeing that they would fit well in this role and mm. like I said with just the recruitment it's not about hiring someone and being like okay it's an escape room run it right mm. it's not it's about their personality it's about how they um are they a problem solver are they mm. going to be the ones who are going to take the lead if something goes wrong it's mm. also about the confidence can they also change like before we used to hire game masters mm. we don't do game masters now our experience is based on actors mm -hmm. so um for us now we have a vision for the library of having different librarians so you don't want everyone the same you need mm -hmm. different who are going to bounce off each other as well and a mixture of like from women to to men to just different characters mm -hmm. so that is something that I'm heavily involved in and I have to say I always do have a good eye for I, I, I don't know what it is I can kind of I know what will work for someone and how they will be in the company and mm. um, so recently obviously with library broken books being new we have had some we've got an amazing team retention for us is always very good like it's um we have people stay with the company for a long time mm. um even like so like with amy's our op manager she's been with us for i think six years mm. Rianne, who now is does the creative lead with us, she's been with us for eight eight years now, seven years. So I'm, um, and again, bear in mind, uh, Simon, that especially with Amy and Rianne, who we have, they've um, we had pandemic. They did have furlough, but then there was a point where obviously furlough stopped. Mm. So they like still stuck with us to have this venue and be up and running with this venue mm. so for someone who's so committed and to be part of tiktok mm. and the fact that they will live breathe everything tiktok so it's mm. a brand they are so invested in and they go all out and then just generally the team they like whenever we need them and obviously there's a lot of we have a lot of students due to the nature of work and um how we have to structure things but they're always on call. They're always wanting to help. They're always, uh, any problem, they're always there. Mm. Um, but no, we, we, have, we have a fantastic team. I, mm. I can't, yeah. What, what, what the Library of Broken Books is, it's also part of, if it's them, it's them. It's mm. them who have created that vision that I had mm. and they've brought it to life by implementing and being the characters that they are. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and for me, it's always been, and especially in a traditional escape room, I've this is something that I've always said. I've always said that I ran games. I did everything from bottom up. And there does come a point to where it gets tedious and it gets boring, especially yeah. as a traditional escape room. Yeah. And where you, it becomes, it's a repetitive thing. It's boring. You just like, mm. And I always said to my team, when you get to that point, that is the time you need to start asking yourself, is this a place for me? And I will never ever say to anyone that why are you leaving? What are you leaving for? Because everyone has their personal growth. Mm. And when you get to that stage, you should go mm. because that, but because what you're, you're not going to give a hundred percent to us. It's just mm. become a job for you now. It's mm. not become something you're enjoying. It's become a repetitive job. So if mm. you need to now move on, I would say do so. Don't do, just stick with the job because that if you become unhappy and you become it's very repetitive, that also shows to our customers mm. and you're not giving them the best experience that they deserve. Mm. So same goes with now. If anyone did feel at that point of, okay, it's the same. Like I said, we give the opportunities to all our team to kind of grow in one way or another and they see mm. their talents and where they can fit in. Mm. That's something that I'm always looking at and consider so anyone who I hire, mm. I, I'm also thinking, how can this person grow in the company? Mm. How can we use them to make the experience or whether it might even be someone who's an actor and they've done marketing, right? Mm. So for me, it's like, okay, how can we get them involved? But I don't ever want anyone to get to a point where they're just seeing it as a job and they mm. become unhappy because that that's the time that I would 
fair to them that just think about where you want to be, how you want to grow, but because they're not going to give a hundred percent. I mean, I've, no... I've been there. I've been there. I've oh, done. Yeah. I've done the job. We've all I've been there. The I think. Yeah. Yeah, and <laughs> I know, and I know that it can be. So when someone says that to me, I'm like, hundred percent. And it's been times where we have lost some really valuable, um, like members of the team. And like I've had a call from the ops manager, and she's saying, and it's it has been like really sad and disheartening but then I'm like no because they have their own personal growth and they need to find their own journey and majority yeah. of our team they are young and like I said they do either start off as students or after they finish uni they end up staying with us mm. but we want them to grow so that's unfair for me to say that no I don't want them to go this way, but at the end of the day, they have to find their own journey and their own success in what they want to do mm. and you know and then and- necessarily like you know thinking of it as losing a person well it's like well no we had that person yeah and we had the best of that person hopefully you know like while they were while they wanted to do this yeah and we have now when we have new games when we have testers or we need to they're the first ones who come running back Mm. and I like it's like I've had when people leave I've like had some lovely emails on how they've loved TikTok and mm. how what they mean. And on the other hand, we have had people leave, mm. and we have had um, and then within a couple of months, and we've had we've had a lot of a lot of members of the team do this, where if they've left, they've gone somewhere else. They've absolutely hated what they're doing, and they want to come back. <laughs> <laughs> and I always said to my ops manager, just wait, and because. Um, we've had a lot of them from being a student yeah and I'm like just wait when they leave us and they go somewhere and they're like oh okay this is so strict and how we are flexible and we do have fun and for us I'm not the kind of strict you better be here on time do this do that for me if you're good with your team they're going to give you that back right Mm. so (laughs) and when they've gone away and then I've always been saying oh guess what they want to come back and I'm like well obviously the opportunities there but the reason they but I have I do also have to say that's something they're to they left for a reason mm. and I do want them to think about why they want to come back here mm. um and put that seed in them to kind of make sure they're coming back for the right reasons as well mm. I mean but you know getting paid to play to play games essentially it's, yeah. it's a great gig isn't it like, yeah yeah um, and, and we're, we're extremely flexible in the terms of it's not like a a strict like sometimes uh, and and uh, I have had obviously uh, some people who have either worked somewhere else they oh we had to do this or they're so strict or we have to whereas for me you provide me with the experience that I visioned yeah and have fun with it it's yeah. this is this is we're in the entertainment industry it's about having fun have mm-hmm. fun with the customers you're making their experience and they want they've come here for fun you have fun as well mm. Okay, so this is the last of the things that affect your work questions. So we're going to do climate change. So, yeah, so how does climate change kind of factor into your work? How are things affected by it? Like, are you, do you have to make any change? Is there any change that you can make? Um, can you include it in the stories? Have you included it in the stories? Like what, what's your response? Regarding climate change, I don't think there's like we're paperless. It's very rarely we use anything. I think the once our sets are built, they are built and used for a very long time. So it's not where we're constantly mm. there's a waste of things. There's not much waste within the rooms. We use very minimum even electric. So I think it's when creating the props. That is the, and once the rooms are built, the rooms, it's all about storytelling. Mm-hmm. So I, regarding the climate change, I don't think there is much there in terms of that has a huge impact mm-hmm. um, where within the business. Um, but it's something that we can teach people through our games. Right. So I think that that's a very valid point of um, as we move on stories, Mm. we know that you have your fiction, Mm. nonfiction books. So what's to say you don't have a room where it's teaching people about climate, climate change. Mm. And not only that, with TikTok, we've always been about teaching, um, Mm. teaching our 
our customers through um, our gameplay. For example, like even with our uh, blueprint room, there was like a, a book about the Battle of Hastings and it's telling all about that. Mm. But as soon as there was like a little code in words and it was like 1066, a year of Battle of Hastings, etc. So it kind of clicked because it's a funny moment. So it was mm. integrating things in a fun way where it's remem- yeah. like memorable. So when people, they they didn't have to read out the whole kind of um, page, but there was like dots on certain letters, which uh, which spell out 1066. Mm. So you would have customers constantly read it and it wouldn't make sense. But then as soon as they did the dots, they were like, oh, it's a battle of Hastings. So mm. it's again, remembering the dates thing. So Again, that's something definite that we can look at um, regarding our games and have it as a story. Mm-hmm. I don't see why not at the end of, uh, and, uh, at the end of anything that we could add educational in, the, in there um, mm-hmm. that would make us happy as well because we're educating people through play. And I, th- I think, you know, like I've a few of the conversations I sort of had through last year, I mean, it really proved to me how much of an appetite there is out there for kind of climate related stuff and mm-hmm. I think you would probably find like you you get quite a quite a big kind of um I think there's a big cohort waiting for those kind of experiences absolutely yeah absolutely and I know like with schools at the moment they're really focusing on it and um and also children they're so intrigued about it like my own two I'm learning about the whole climate change and my son talking about trees and how it's mean to chop down these trees and it's it's great and like it, it's good and I think like it's not something that I've thought about and I think in gameplay you always kind of go towards the kind of fiction and the mm. whole fantasy of mm. something but yeah why why aren't we doing Jimmy non-fiction why why aren't we teaching through yeah it's something definitely I'll I'll start thinking about or creating new fictions I mean, that's when I've been talking to artists and writers, it's generally the, the conversation about like, you know, how do we, I think, I think the art, the way to create climate art has not quite been figured out yet. And I think we're in that process of, because art well, will Simon, be the thing. We have, that... we have mid journey now and we have chat GTP. <laughs> 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 Things will be changing hugely. <laughs> Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I don't know if you've had a play around with it, um, but I've, I've recently got into um, the Mid Journey and um, Chat GTP, and um, mm. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm in the process of maybe doing something, seeing what works if there's a combination of both of them. But Mid Journey, mm. I've have been having a play with that, and it's just, it's just crazy because you're like, where's that going to lead to, and job wise, like, where is it? where's the end and like especially being in the creative industry it's mm. it's a bit of an eye open like you have so many talented people out there but then when you can do something in two minutes and give the prompts that you have and to yeah. create something it's but you know this yourself from like you know you and you've said it in this this recording of mm. like you know finding the people because it's those people you know the yeah. experiences that you're creating and you know initially it was just the puzzles but now with the people they're creating the experiences yeah. and people buy from people yeah uh, you know you don't want you don't want a robot to stroke your head and send you to of sleep course, you know? of course <laughs> but then for a lot of businesses the amount of time it cuts yeah yeah and the expenses yeah i um, the overheads i have on that where mm. something do you mean can be done within minutes of mm. just giving the instructions so there's also that so I can see businesses swaying towards there because it mm. cuts that but then you're right to get someone who is valuable um and who is do you mean like who would really have an impact and um, but I think I'm seeing it more down the crit so for example getting posters made getting things made mm. you would reach out you would find the people that you really want to work with and mm. what their talent is and so they can create you something beautiful but now if you have a software that can do that for you and you know how to do it that's cutting out that person which in a way like for me it's like they have the talent, this is the thing. But then if you don't have the funding for that person, then you are going to resort to the mid-journey mm-hmm. or the chat GTP, aren't you? Because mm-hmm. it's a, it's like every company for them, it's a financial side of things. 
um, ethically is not a gym and it's not because like at the end of the day you would want as many people who have these talents so because I know just generally with the mid journey I've had a lot of um, on this group as well with uh, they do a lot of AI and uh, there has been a lot of backlash um, from artists and mm. saying that and I, I mean like some of it's harsh some of the back but I can see where they're coming from mm. because it's like for them it's their hard work their talent and mm. then it's easy for someone to start sharing all these pictures and mm. um so it's it's interesting it's so so new at the moment mm. but and I know every day people are discovering it and I think I've been like working on it for the last a month or more and um but it's it's interesting and it's just the thoughts of where it's where it's going yeah mm. Mm. yeah okay yeah. that was a good little diversion yeah. wasn't it <laughs> yeah, um sorry. No, no, that was great. That was really good. Um, yeah, I, I mean, you know, it's the first time it's come up. And I, I used to initially sort of talk about future of work and stuff or try and get it in there. Mm. And, you know, like I used to be all all for total, total unemployment, like, you know, total unemployment. Mm. <laughs> Automate everything. No yeah, one yeah, job. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. It's, it's funny because I, I was on... Um, when I went to Boston, I part the there was a girl that I um, was on the who had been selected, and she was working on the AI thing at the time, and that was 2017. Mm. And like she was like talking about how it would change things, do things, and at the time I didn't really take much like much notice to it. Like to me, it was like, but if you're going to introduce this, it's very robotic, and like people are going to and it's and it's a conversation I had with her then that. People are going to lose their jobs. For example, if offices start using it, and you have Jimmy Chat GTP, it's going to it's, the AI is taking over, and that obviously for her it was a whole purpose. And she was the under thirty Forbes, and oh, it's very passionate about it. And now that it's here and it's real, and you think, wow, it's just everything from even the conversions of pictures. You can get a child's picture and turn it into a thing, and it's. It's like everything, like, and also plagiarism. That's that's baffles me at the moment. Like universities, um, like if they have an assignment, what's to say someone can't just do it in Chat GTP? Mm. But then how does copyright. The plagiarism work copyright. on that? Copyright. Yeah, but how? But is is the plagi is is anything? In, nothing. I know that nothing's in place at the moment. But yeah. the whole kind of how how would they go about that I know that there's one someone who's working on how to identify whether it's been done by AI mm. um for schools and colleges and universities but it's, it's it's interesting it's interesting what's now going to be implemented to stop all this yeah but it's it's also why as well isn't it it's like I saw a thing of Microsoft Microsoft's doing something or, or one of these companies I won't say them specifically even if it was um but you know doing this thing where they can clone your voice in just however many it's like why would you want that like yeah. why would you, the only person that needs that is someone who needs to copy your voice yeah you know, it's, like, it's there's no practical similar. use for yeah. a person well it's very similar to tiktok mm. right so you can create content but if you don't you want your voice you can put other voices on mm. and um and I, I i i in a way i see why if you just don't want jimmy and if I know that I I would hit doing a voiceover and something so to have that mm -hmm. but I think you do have all them aspects already in TikTok which people are doing mm. right it's it's already there it's already teaching people that you don't need to use your right voice you don't need to use your face you don't need to do that you can do it other ways or you can add filters to make you more beautiful life do you it's it's, mm. it's, it's crazy it's mm. how it's so is is the realism there anymore no it's not because it's all covered by the filters and the voices and mm. it's about how creative can you be mm. Mm. oh yeah I did have yeah. one other question on mm -hmm. that so um when it was the hottest day last year how did that affect you when we were up to 39 were you like it was AC'd amazing. Or... <laughs> we, we're in a we're in a basement <laughs> <laughs> we're in a very it's it's funny because in the summers it's Cool, just nice and cool mm. and in the winters it's still cool it's not too cold either so mm. it's it works in our favor mm. um where we've never really had to kind of be like oh it's too cold in here we need heating because mm. people are moving around it does get like 
they do get warm quite quickly and then mm. in the um yeah we never had any any issues regarding because it was just cool it's mm. stone so that's the best thing about being in yorkshire <laughs> <laughs> keeps everyone cool <laughs> so we'll go into the change question first and then i'll do ubi mm -hmm. so if you could change any three things about your work right now um anything at all what would they be things that i can change i don't think there is anything I would want to change um, purely because if I change things, I wouldn't have the faults that I've had mm. to experience what I have had. Mm -hmm. um, I think we learn as we go along. So any, um, any hiccups that we have along the way, we have to learn from it and then make sure how we can resolve that. The vet, obviously, the venue that we're at, <laughs> that would that is probably one thing that um, I wish there was wasn't any leaks um, or any problems <laughs> causing us there, because um, yep. then we could have been ahead of ourselves. And to have more games up and running, I think mm. I think the vision was to roll quickly, have new rooms. But like I said, I think um, the the venues been quite challenging. So mm. um, maybe having a venue which wasn't as challenging. And we could have just easily got on with things like maybe having something that was already built out and it wasn't a bank vaults where it would cause a lot of issues. Mm. I think, yeah, I, th I think there's all a lot of things, but then if we didn't have these issues, we wouldn't learn. Mm. I feel like I always learn from something. So um, to make us stronger in who we are and what we do. Mm. And it, it's, ju it's just been a huge learning in terms of... Um, before with the landlords and the, the companies that take care of the buildings, like previously, we've had not much to do with mm -hmm. the landlords or it's always been like, once we've had the lease, here you go, you can get on with it. These are the terms and conditions and off you go. Mm -hmm. But I think being the building that it's in and being more of a prestige building, there's a lot of terms and conditions around it. There's a yeah. lot of, um, and the managing company, there's a lot of things that we have to provide them. And it's just not been as easy um, mm -hmm. because there's multiple people you have to um, communicate with and you feel like you go around in circles rather than mm -hmm. getting anything done. And I think that for me personally has been quite draining in the terms of me moving forward with my business and bear in mind we are a small business mm. and we're not a big corporate business and um the building that we are in there's a lot of offices we are a different we're not an office we are mm. an entertainment business that provides gym and gaming and entertainment whereas I think they've never dealt with an entertainment company before so mm. they're doing very much things of how an uh, office um yeah how it would be like in, in an office suite yeah. And our terms and conditions are very different to what theirs were. So I think for them, it's been new. And for us, we've never had that where the, they've had so much of a say in our mm. build and how we do things, which yeah. has been extremely frustrating yeah. and soul destroying, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think maybe having a... A venue where I didn't have to deal with all that, and I can just focus on the game. Yeah. Gameplay. I mean, would would you always want to kind of have that flexibility and ability to be able to go into a space, adapt to the space, you know, for your own practice and for the business, or would you prefer that there was like a, you know, would the ideal be a dedicated build? And like, if you had a dedicated build then you've got all those problems of like trying to locate it, get the size, get the building and like how much you want built. And so, to, to be honest, Simon, we have, so prior to obviously getting the premises that we're in, a year, it took us a year um, actually sorting out. So we hadn't signed the lease. So before we even went into that premises, we had the structural engineer have a look. We had the architects involved. We had the rooms all set out. Everything was done. So it's, it's not the case of um, we've gone in and then we've started planning where everything yeah. should go. No, all this was done prior to that. Yeah. That was also what the landlord wanted to see exact plans and what we're using, where the structural side is going to come. That all had to be done. So that was all done prior to that. I think once we 
so that was done with the landlords, their solicitors, everything was mm-hmm. done with them. Um, but then, as you know, that there'll be other managing companies who mm-hmm. then come in once you take over the lease. And we had done that, but we had to do that again yeah. once we got the thing. And yeah. what we couldn't understand, but why are we having to go through that process and spend more money yeah. on doing all that when all that had been done? And then it's like certain, obviously, documents for this, documents for build for this or what we're doing mm. and the slight changes you make. And like I said, we've had, it's not like we've not had, June, we've not been in other premises. We've had leases, mm. different sites, and but we've never, it's never been this difficult. Uh, maybe it's a bank fault or maybe it's just the way they manage things. Yeah. But I think it's just been extremely, and being like also, <laughs> I, I I also felt like being a female founder that whereas obviously the managing side of things very male dominated and maybe being a mm. female founder it was maybe a little bit kind of different for them and um, mm. yeah I I feel like I've I've had to jump a lot of hurdles and I'm mm. um, just to kind of sort out the venue that I'm in rather than focusing on what my forte is and creating yeah. people experiences so. Um, it's, it's it's not been an easy journey it has yeah. been uh, a little bit difficult but it's um more about how do we move forward from it mm. and to create more because like we've had people now come saying when are you opening your next set of rooms but it's like yeah that's what we want to do but <laughs> it's but not only that what they obviously because the whole thing has set us back financially it's also mm. setting us back and it's having a huge impact on the business um Whereas to a point when there is leaks in the space that we need to be doing works in, mm. that's financially like now for us, we the capacity that we were supposed to have open right now mm. isn't open. But for us financially, what we had projected, that's not going to hit that because mm. there's been certain mm. issues, ongoing certain issues, which have, haven't been dealt with. Yeah. So now we're not hitting that and that could have a further impact. So. Yeah. We just have to, um, yeah, just try to quickly work something out and see where we can go with it. Mm. It can, it's, it's not going to lie, it's not been an easy journey. So I think next time I just kind of, if I'm looking for venues, just to make sure that, <laughs> look deeper into who we're managing, what they do and how they go yeah. about things and let us get on with things as well. Yeah, I, I mean, it, and again, it comes back to those sort of building relationships things, doesn't it? And that's yeah. why you stick with people because it's like, right, you know us, you get us, you yeah. know what we want. Like, we know that you're going to give us that, so we're going to stay with you. And that's, you know. But we were in King's house um, for a good five years. Well, yeah, mm. for over five years. So we were in King's house until this day. Like, I know it was, um, I don't know, I think they're brilliant Um it was WSB who were the managing company and anything I could give them a call they were straight away on site if something went wrong and mm. um, they were they were just they worked worked with me they worked with us and it mm. was like um they would be like we'll get this sorted don't worry it's it's fine but mm. I think it's when like recently it's just been I've realized not everyone's the same yeah. and you just have to um just move on (laughs) just keep moving on and try Mm. to resolve things as you go along and Mm. like I said King's house was I didn't even feel like anyone was kind of in charge or Mm. um they just and we had a lot of lift people stuck in lifts and they would be on call 24 7 we would Mm. call them and they would be like right no problem we'll get Mm. so-and-so out we'll get so-and-so out it'll be resolved within the next day it was just resolved so Yeah. yeah 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 Yeah. yeah, and the thing is, what has an impact on us has an impact on our customers because they yeah. see, right? Yeah. They, they see, they see if there's a leak, if there's something going on, they see yeah. it. So yeah. that's an impact on us thinking, oh, we went and they had this going on or they had this going on yeah. and that affects the branding. Yeah. So it's not just me, it's affecting then that it affects the morale of the team. Yeah. Because then someone, if someone's negative about something, then a review comes through and then that just knocks the individuals or as a team it knocks them mm. yeah 
but then there's the whole thing I, I won't go too far into this but then there's the whole thing of like you don't know what's necessarily going on in that business or those businesses and it's like oh well we haven't got any staff and we can't do this but it's like not my problem <laughs> you know so you yeah. get into all of those things but yeah that's a whole we we could go off left right and center with all of yeah. this yeah so I'm gonna stop us yep, there that's fine um so I'm gonna go on to the UBI question just quickly mm -hmm. so if there was a UBI, if you got a universal basic income, um, how do you think it would change your work? Would you have gone into doing what you do now? Uh, would you be doing the work as much? Would you be doing something else entirely? How do you think it would affect you? I think I would have done what I've done. I would have gone out there and searched for help, mm. for funding. Mm -hmm. I'm just the type of person that I am. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people have a perception of if you don't have uh, if you have a less income um or um you're kind of you you can't do anything right mm -hmm. i think anything is possible mm -hmm. if you have the right guidance and support there's a lot of support out there so i went through when i first started i went through um the bradford um it was a scheme that they did to help um startups and they guide them and uh, it's been so long I've forgotten the exact name for it but they really guided me on like the business plan where I'm mm -hmm. going with this mm -hmm. um even though financially I didn't get anything but the guidance of doing a business plan and mm -hmm. to kind of make you look at the wider picture really mm -hmm. helped and starting a business you don't need to start big right mm. starting small is always I started small and I mm. slowly grew and I think the best the advice that I would give anyone who's wanting to even or even like thinks that I don't have the income I don't have the money there's a lot of funding out there there's a lot of grants you just need to find the right people and you need to find the right grants that are out there and just stay focused and do it if you have an idea just do it because if you don't do it you're never going to know mm. you, 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 you're never going to know you're never going to know whether you're always going to have that if and for me I always it was like no I'm going to do it and I had a lot of pressure um due to my family being from a uh, Pakistani background Asian background we have it always like parents are always like no focus on your education you need to now go into that education once you've got a job so I was working in school and for my parents like you can't leave your job you can't leave your job and it's like yeah and they're like but your income how's what's going to be coming in like mm. nothing's going to be coming in and I was like now I'm going to give it a go let's do it mm. if it happens it happens if it doesn't it doesn't and that's why I did it I did it as a pilot yeah. and lucky enough obviously it, it did work but there was a lot of hurdles I had to overcome as well mm. and I think like if you think about that you don't have the money do your research there is there's a lot of people out there to, if, if you have an idea and you know it's a scalable idea reach out to people it's mm. possible because mm. otherwise you'll never know yeah no, I think that's a really good answer. Uh, I'm not going to delve into that any further mm. or take us out on any divergent paths. <laughs> so I'm going to uh, like I'm going to try and come in on time for us. So I'm going to throw it over to you um, at this point. Is there anything that you want to talk about that we may have missed or overlooked or if there's anything that you want to promote or um, if you want to give us your socials? So this is just your time to kind of discuss whatever you want. I think I want to uh, kind of have a clear message for the youngsters these days um and just kind of like so I, I think just going back onto what we said is if you have any business ideas business opportunities explore it and yeah I, I think the the thing is is to go out there find the right funding find the right people because anything that I've done over the last nine years I've had a lot of hurdles I've had a lot of things to overcome but that's only made me stronger 
and I've learned from it and I can move on to make things better the next time. And that's where the Library of Broken Books has come. So for me, it wasn't, I set up an escape room. There's so many, what differentiates us from it? It's because we've observed, we've learned, we've created a team that are amazing. Mm. Um, yeah, so come and find out more about us. And if anyone needs to talk about anything, I'm always here to kind of help guide as well. Mm. Um, um, but yeah, so, uh, where TikTok unlocked the Library of Broken Books. Um, if you're looking for a team building event or birthdays or just wanting to do sort of a special occasion, hens, dogs, and um, even with families, come to the Library of Broken Books. This is the start of us. And um, we are looking to obviously expand, do different things. Yeah. And also we are going, we are looking at um investments. So if anyone out there who's listening to this and wants to maybe in, uh, invest, looking at franchise opportunities, um, do reach out to us. The web address is TikTok uh, www.tiktokunlock.com. And um we're on Instagram, TikTok, um, everywhere. Facebook, <laughs> everywhere, LinkedIn. So if you want to personally get in touch with me, add me on LinkedIn and I'd be more than happy to speak to anyone. Cool. And I would just add on there because, I, you know, I think you've said this and I don't think you'll agree, uh, disagree with it. But like, you know, if you are going to go and, and do something like it is a lot of hurdles, but people will help you. You know, not everybody, but every now and again, someone will turn up and, you know, like if you're struggling with something particular, like they'll come and give you a hand. They may not do it for you, but, you know, people, yeah. or they'll point you in the right direction. Like things turn up, don't they? Yeah, I think things do definitely do like happen for a reason. But another thing that I always say as well, I've, I've experienced it myself. So yes, there's a lot of people out there to help you. But then there's a lot of people who mm. will scout and want to find out about what you do, how you do it. And intentions are different. Mm. So it's always being careful on who you're trusting mm. and what path you're wanting to take with things. Um, as it's not always everyone's out there for your interest so yeah. you you do have to be careful on what is the agenda what is the purpose behind it are they generally wanting to help you or is it something they want to find out about what you're doing yeah. and it might be whereas I've, I've I've been down that route and I've had open discussions that's the type of person I am but yeah. you sometimes have to be careful of what information you should give yeah. and what you should be discussing yeah, I think that's a key point as well, because, yeah. you know, it's not that everyone's out to get you, but, you know, some people are out to get you. And... Yeah, <laughs> well, I, th I think I think it's just when when it comes to business opportunities and someone has even a great idea, mm. it's um, always there are going to be people who are wanting to start and who are wanting to verify and great ideas. And it's not necessarily, Jimmy, like you might not have the time or the money or something to, uh, to execute it, but mm. that other person may have that and yeah. think actually they've not done it the market's open yeah. and the opportunities there why why not do it yeah. so it's um which in a way that's how the world works and that's how you roll with it <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If, if there's an opportunity in the market then why not thank you again to sam for being my guest thanks again to all my guests and thanks to you leads for being my subject and of course most of all thank you to you my dear listener I still desperately need to get at least 10 more people to record as soon as possible, so do take the plunge and get your working hours recording done now. The sooner you come on the show, the better, because let's be real, if this podcast doesn't get some basic foundational support to secure its future, then it has none. Apparently I'm the only person in this city that thinks it would be interesting and useful to have a resource of first-hand accounts of what it's like to work now. No one in this city wants so resource of the sort of jobs people do right now and what those roles are like and what you would need to do to do those roles. Only a handful of people want to advertise their business for free or promote themselves or their careers. Only a handful of people in Leeds can see potential, which is a shame because I thought we were better than that. But we're all full of illusions we need to be disabused of, aren't we? These apparently are mine. If it's not the show, then it's me, and I get that, I'm an obnoxious little shit, but that's a bitter pill given some of the god-awful personalities you see and hear out there. Really, I'm worse than them. Well, whatever. I've put the majority of any money I have had in the last three years into this show, going from losing studio space to recording on my end-of-life PC to recording on my phone to recording on Zoom. I've had to deal with the DWP again for so long. 
dancing around like a fucking monkey for peanuts and humiliation. I've tried to be patient. I've tried to be steady, largely, outside the odd outburst. I think I did all right. I even tried to put less of me in the show at points. But I'm done now. I have no indication that any more than one, maybe two people want this or gets value from it, and I know it's not my guess putting people off. I'm spent up and burnt out, and I can't take anything anymore. I'm just done. So, if I can, I will press on to get that 100 episodes, get at least a tenth of the way to the goal. 10% is better than nothing. But then, that might well be your lot. So, get on this show now. Do it. Do it now. Practice your pitch in a safe environment. Practice your media skills in a safe environment. Take some time to think deeply about your work. Workers of Leeds, be recorded. You have nothing to lose but everything, which will happen to you at the end anyway, so why worry? If you would like to hear more about Leeds and about work, if you can see the resource I want to create and you can recognise its possible value to now and any possible future we might have, then now is the time to step up and offer any support you can from a tiny one-off donation to a big lump sum, from a small regular amount to generous monthly subsidy, short-term, long-term, whatever. Got no money? Share your favourite episode. Been on the show? Share your episode again. Or even, for the first time, pursued your butcher, your baker, your plastic tap maker to come on the show, or to listen to it, or to promote it, or to support it. I don't know how many different ways or times I can say this to what seems like no one for what seems like pretty much zero results. Oh, and if you'd like to record your interview, just be aware that I can't afford to record online anymore until further notice. So you'll need to ask me about an in-person recording because, as I said, I can no longer afford to record remotely. Also, I can no longer afford to pay for the podcast host. So if you would like the podcast to still be there next month, then 20 quid to pay for my Captivate FM, my podcast host, will keep them all up there for one more month. It amazes me that there's not one organisation in Leeds of whatever type that wouldn't like an evergreen bit of marketing on this podcast for £15. If you're a foreign company looking to take money off liners and out of the city, or you're a big conglomerate looking to drive down wages and lower standards, then get in touch. I'm happy to market you for 25 quid on a show. So yeah, you've got a month to listen to any of these shows that you'd like to, because let's face it, if Yorkshire is famous for anything, it's been tight. So I ain't going to get any patrons out of this city. You can follow the show on Twitter at Working Hours 3 and on Instagram at Working Hours Pod Lead. Use the hashtag Working Hours Pod Leads to stay up to date on when new episodes are being released. DM me with your questions or most importantly to get in touch if you'd like to be my guest on this show. Not destroying your brain with social media? Then send me an email to workinghourspod at western-studios.com or if you'd like to be anonymous, email me at westernstudios at protonmail.com. If you enjoyed this episode, please remember to share it with your networks. Please, please do chuck in anything you can to help Working Hours grow. Go to Kofi, that's ko-fi.com forward slash working hours and join me there for £3 a month. And or you can make any one-off donation of whatever amount through that site. Or you can go to patreon.com forward slash working hours pod to support working hours from as little as a pound a month. There's also an Outlander tier for non loiners at £5 a month and a £12 a month big time tier for anyone who feels flash. I'm not really offering anything much on the Patreon yet, as I'm already doing more than enough unpaid labour on this project. If and when things pick up, then we'll see. The goal is to make the podcast and my commitment to it both possible and sustainable. If you are happy to make a regular contribution, but you're priced out by a pound a month, you can go to librapay.com, that's L-I-B-E-R-A-P-A-Y dot com forward slash Western Studios forward slash donate and donate from as low as a penny a week all the way up to £89 a week. And people say I'm pessimistic. Again, you can also make one-off donations through LibraPay, which you can do either publicly or anonymously. Remember to like, share, follow and subscribe to Working Hours. Work for peace and plan with kindness. OK, that's me. Cheers, ears. Take care out there and be kind to each other, Leeds. Working Hours is produced, recorded, edited and published by Simon Treen for Western Studios Leeds Limited.
The music was The Bees from Chopin's Etude, which is in the public domain and was taken from museopen.org. Follow Western Studios Leeds on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash western underscore studios underscore leads and on linkedin linkedin.com forward slash company forward slash western hyphen studios or go to western hyphen studios.com <laughs>